two questions that God's people have to ask themselves for this particular time. Uh, number one, I think for this group, is this one. Do you really want to be excellent in a mediocre world? If so, uh, you can't just do the same things the world is doing, measured by the same degree of success that the world is looking for, and call yourself a Christian. Can't be done. God's way is not an alternative way. It is the way. I don't know that God's people in our generation truly understand that. Let me back up a little bit and tell you, I was not a Christian until I was 32 years old. I came out of a non-Christian family in a kind of a Christian era. I went to a public high school. And the average public high school, I think, when I graduated in 1958, was probably as Christian as the average Christian school today. Um, we weren't overtly Christian, but it wasn't abnormal to pray. I wasn't a Christian at all. Didn't know much about it. And it didn't seem to, you know, to pollute my brain to be able to pray with the guys at football and baseball and the other things. And I was a science major. In order to graduate from high school, you had to take a course in history. I, I never had taken a course in history. Had absolutely no interest in taking a course in history. And uh, I ended up in my senior year, the last semester, uh, the last possible time, taking a course in world history. And in that course, we studied the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. And I forevermore, from that point on, got hooked on history. As I read through that book and, and we debated various things, I know the thing that was most important in my mind, paramount in my mind all the way through there, how could those Romans have been so stupid? How could they? I mean, they had the best country in the world. They had the best economy in the world, the best military in the world, best legal system in the world. And they really had the best um, ethic, not morality now, but best ethic for Romans. And yet within 200 years, they were utterly decimated by a group of barbarians. And forevermore, that nation or that civilization really ceased to exist. As a Christian now for the better part of 32 years, I look at where we are and think, how could we be so stupid? We're the best nation in the world, the best economy in the world, the best military in the world, the best legal system in the world, founded upon the premise that Jesus Christ is Lord of all and we are losing it. We're giving it away. We're, we're standing by while a handful of devout people who are the antithesis of what we believe in are taking it away from us. We outnumber, if you label them, let's label them liberals, you have to label them something. Let's label them liberal. They really aren't liberals. A liberal means you believe in, in everybody having the same opportunity as everybody else. That's the opposite of what liberals are, but label them liberals. By any count that you want to use, we outnumber them 10,000 to one and probably 100,000 to one. The thing that they have that we lack is absolute dedication to the cause they believe in. We say that we have dedication to the cause we believe in, but we do not demonstrate it. And I'll show you that as we get through here a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm going to try. I used to be uh, far more agile at, at uh, handling two things at one time than I am right now. I'm going to try to handle I told uh, Marcel, I'm going to try to to handle two things here. One is to look at some extra notes I wrote here and try to keep this screen up to where I am. But as a standby, Stan Rife, I think, has a clicker over here. So in case I miss it, he's going to catch up with me. The question you have to ask yourself, the fundamental question, first as business people, you have to ask yourself, are you willing to be excellent in a world that's really just mediocre? I don't mean just excellent in the way that you handle a product or make a profit, but excellent. Because the standard by which God will judge your excellent, excellence will not be how much money you have accumulated, how big a business you have, and how many products you're able to produce and sell. That is the way the world measures it. But you'll see as we get through here, that is not the way God measures excellence at all. Second question that every believer has to ask themselves is, do you believe? Uh, I was talking to uh, Horst Schultz today, and we've had a very similar experience. So I, I know he understands where I'm coming from. Uh, seven and a half, a little bit more than seven and a half years ago, uh, out of kind of a clear blue sky, I always assumed being a Burkett, I would die of a heart attack, because that's been the tradition in my family for as far back as anybody can remember. In my father's generation, none of that generation of men lived beyond 58 years old. My father was the oldest one of six brothers who died at 58, all from a heart attack. 
And I used to think, you know, it's really rotten being saddled with bad genes. Uh, if you want good health, the one thing I would assure you, the best thing you can do for yourself is pick your parents real carefully. That's the best way you can have good health. And uh, my, par my parents passed along bad uh, artery genes to me. But I always thought, well, we get, can we get heart attacks maybe, but we never have cancer. Nobody in my family ever had cancer. Uh, that is not a guarantee. We, they just never lived long enough, most of them, to get cancer, I'm convinced. Because I took up golf at 55 years old because all of my brothers played golf. I didn't, never thought I would take up golf. Number one, it, I thought it was boring, I thought it took too long, and it cost too much money. But my brothers and I started having family reunions again for the first time in 25 years, and they all played golf, so they would all go off without me, and I decided I was going to learn to play golf. And from the time I swung a club, my left shoulder hurt so bad that within about a month or so, I couldn't lift my arm. I realized something was wrong. And, went to orthopedist after orthopedist trying to find out what the problem was and was uh, misdiagnosed most of the time, being rotator cuff or bursitis or arthritis. Couldn't find out it wasn't that, it was cancer. It had started in my right kidney and metastasized up to the left shoulder. In, in case you're not aware, metastatic renal cell carcinoma. You know, I've really gotten, gotten to know medical terms because if you want to talk to doctors, you have to talk in medical terms. When I want to talk to somebody that I think has got a great treatment I want to evaluate, I call their assistant, either their nurse or more likely their, their uh, personal assistant, and I'll say to them, this is Dr. Burkett. I'd like to talk to Dr. Smith about uh, a metastatic renal cell carcinoma patient. And they'll all talk to me. They never ask me, what kind of a doctor do you have? <laughs> all, they, all they care about is you can talk the language. If you talk the language, they, they think you know what you're talking about. Well, I had metastatic renal cell carcinoma. I, I, I learned shortly after that my doctor's a neat guy, the guy, the urologist that I use, really neat guy, Christian guy, um, very honest, and I like that. He said, I have to tell you the truth, you've got very little chance of survival. The average rate of survival with your cancer over a two-year period of time is one half of 1%. That's how many people will survive. There were 73 of us diagnosed at Emory in 1995, uh, 72 of whom died within two years. And here I am, almost eight years out, so you know, you never know. But the one thing it has done for me is made me have a much greater appreciation, number one, for who God is and what God expects of us. It forces you, no matter what you want to do, to focus on what's important, not what's urgent, what's important about life. Because life is really short. Most of us don't think about it until we're facing it. But life is really short. Death comes very quickly to us. And we don't live here. And if you think you do live here, it's a real disappointment to have death come that quickly. We live in eternity, where we are in the whole lifetime. If I live to be 100 years here, it's a blip so small you can't even see it on the eternity line. It's just a little blip. Where we're going to live is eternity forever and ever and ever with the Lord Jesus Christ. What we're doing now is setting the stage for who we will be and what we will be and how effective we will be throughout eternity. And I think, I know that, that uh, Horst understands that very well. When you look death right in the eye, it forces you to reevaluate. If I could do one thing for the body of Christ, I would give them all a terminal illness and put it on hold. Well, they never knew when it was going to be activated because you would see an instant shift in priorities, in attitudes about things, houses and cars and businesses and all the rest. Doesn't mean you wouldn't keep doing what you do. I'm still doing exactly what I was doing. A little less effectively sometimes, but still doing it. It's not those, that that's important. It's how you do it, why you do it, and what the end result's going to be. And I measure everything I do anymore against, I've got a limited amount of energy and a limited amount of time, so I measure everything I do against, is this the most important thing I could do with the gifts that God has given me for the body of Christ? If not, I don't do it, period. I would have never done that before. That's why I don't run uh, Crown Financial Ministries or Christian Financial Concepts. My energy and ability could be far better used with the gifts that God has given me, and one of them is not the gift of administration, that's for sure. As anybody who's around me knows, I hate meetings. I never did like meetings, as a matter of fact. You know, there's two words for believe in the scripture. James uses one. We're all familiar with this passage. You say that you believe. I tell you the demons believe. You believe that God is one. I tell you the demons believe, and they shudder. It does them no good. The word that James used there is a unique Greek word. There are actually four Greek words for believe, but the word that he used here means you intellectually assent. You intellectually